Okay, so how is everyone today? Good, I hope. Another glorious week of calculus. <coughs> so, just to remind you of procedural things. So, every Monday and Wednesday night, there's online homeworks that are due. That is the My Math Lab things. Okay? Uh, every lecture, there are written homeworks due. That's, that's these. Uh, these particular written homeworks correspond to uh, what? Lecture number five, I think, or something? I don't recall. Yeah, so these correspond to lecture number five. But as the semester goes on, I'll, I'll lose count. I won't be able to recall off the top of my head. Uh, which is the reason why I post, posted that web page that said, what's on quiz whatever? Okay, because I can't remember either, so, so I, can't, I don't really expect you to remember, uh, like off the top of your head, but I expect you to be able to look it up, okay, because I've compiled it for you. So last week were quizzes one and two. Currently running, as of yesterday morning, are quizzes three and four. So they're due um, Saturday at the close of business of the testing center. Any question about that? So now, I, I don't remember what is on quiz three. I, re I really and truly don't. Uh, but I, I recorded what's on quiz three, and it's on that web page. So quiz three is over lecture three, and the written homeworks that correspond to that are who knows what, but they're, they're written down. Okay, so any question about that? So some other matters. So now that you've all taken quizzes one and two, some of you, many of you, especially the other section, uh, express concern like, I'm not sure I did so great on those quizzes. Okay, I understand. Uh, let's go over how your grade is calculated in this class. So there's three categories of assignment. There's online homework, written homework, and quizzes. Those are the only three categories. So online homework, there's going to be 22 of them. Maybe 20, but probably 22. And <laughs> what are they doing over there? <laughs> uh, there's going to be 22 of them. We're going to drop the lowest two. Okay. And then uh, we'll compute the average, and, and that will constitute 15% of your grade. Written homeworks, there's going to be on the order of 80 of them. Okay. For, for written homeworks, only a subset of the written homeworks are graded by hand. Okay. And in such cases, they're graded out of 10. Okay. So I don't remember which ones are graded, but... And I'm not sh sure that that's list. You can figure it out by looking at the grade book, but it's kind of, it's kind of hard. So I'll, I'll make a web page that says which ones were graded and which ones weren't. So only a subset of them are graded. The rest are for completion. The ones that are graded are graded out of 10 points. And in the grade book, that's symbolized with 0 through 9, me meaning 0 out of 10, 1 out of 10, up to, up to 9 out of 10, or A, which means 10 out of 10. Now, the reason why A means 10 out of 10 is actually a really uh, banal reason. And it's just that if you look at the bubbles at the bottom of the page, a 10 won't fit in a bubble, right? <laughs> Zero fits in the bubble, one fits in the bubble, but a 10 doesn't fit in the bubble, so I put an A in the bubble. Okay. So your grade is... Zero through A uh, for the ones that are graded. The ones that aren't graded, uh, what I do is I just note whether or not you completed the assignment. So if you completed the assignment, then you're given a C for complete. And that's reckoned as being one 
out of one possible point. So you either did complete the assignment, in which case you get a C, which is numerically equivalent to one out of one, or you get a zero, which is numerically equivalent to zero out of one for the complete ones. So your written homework, grade. Suppose that at this time that there's 20 written homeworks assigned and that six of them were graded, then how many points possible is it for just those six? 60, right? Because six were graded each out of 10. So there's 60 possible points there. Then suppose that 14 were graded for completion. How many possible points is that? 14, because each, each one of those is one possible point then the total, total possible number of points for your written homework is, at that, supposing those things are true, is 74. 60 because 6 were graded out of 10, and another 14 because those were graded each out of 1, complete or not. So then the way your written homework grade is calculated is the total number of points that you achieved divided by the total possible that you could achieve multiplied by 100 to get a percentage. So you can see in the grade book there's a grade called WHW numerator. That's what you achieved. And then there's a value called WHW denominator. That's the maximum value you could have achieved. So if you, if you lost just a couple of points in this hypothetical scenario we're talking about, you might have a numerator value of say 70 mm -hmm and a denominator value of 74. So that your written homework grade is 70 over 74 multiplied by 100. Okay, that's how your written homework grade is reckoned. And uh, that's 15% of your course grade. Okay, so any question about the written homework? Then the quizzes, okay. The quizzes are the balance. That is to say, 70% of your course grade. That's what really counts. Really, really counts. So by the end of the course, uh, we will have had, I think, 14 quizzes is what's scheduled. 14 quizzes. Now, on each quiz, there are three exercises. However, only two out of those three exercises is graded. And I don't advertise in advance which two out of three will be graded. What that means is that by the end of the course, you will have 28 graded quiz exercises by the end of the course. Then, for the final exam, there will be a further 10 or so quiz exercises. It'll be just like a normal quiz, except it's got 10 exercises on it, so it'll be longer. All of those will be graded. So that means that there's going to be on the order of 40 uh, quiz exercises. 28 that you take during the course of the semester, 10 that you take on the final exam. So those 10 are mandatory. You must, take, you must attempt those questions or you will receive zeros for them. That's the mandatory part of the final exam. The optional part of the final exam is that all of those 28 quiz questions that you did before the final, they're all individually recorded in the gradebook. And all of those papers are graded, and you can download scans of them, and you can look at each of those 28. I will give you 10 opportunities to fix whichever 10 you think is in your best interest. So many of you, many of you told me in email or in person, oh, I'm not feeling good about quiz one and two. Okay, I get that. Suppose the worst scenario, that you made zeros on, on all four of the questions that were graded. That's the, that's the worst that could possibly have happened. On the final exam, you can redo those four questions. And you can have the better of the two grades. So if on quiz one, question three, you made a four out of 10, and you decide to redo it on the final, and on the redo version of quiz one, question three, you make a nine out of 10, you can have your nine. 
But if you make a 1 out of 10, you can still keep your 4. Whichever one was better. Okay? So does everyone understand the system? So again, the reason for that system is, in the first place, it's my teaching philosophy that I don't really care if last week you didn't understand the quiz one material. I mean, I do care. I think I'm, it's a bit of a concern. But in the end, the only thing that I really need from you is for you to understand the material by the time you leave. That's all I really need from you. So, so that's why I like to do the redo thing. Another reason is that each of you are individuals and you have your own individual strengths and weaknesses. So by the time at the end of the semester, each of you will be able to assess for yourself, oh, it would be in my best interest to study this thing because that's where I was weakest. And that is my best chance for improvement on the final exam. So each of you has your own individual uh, study plan to, to do what's best for you. Okay, so any questions about the system? Okay, now another thing I want to say is that I'll remind you again, now that the quizzes are going and now that you've taken a quiz, I have office hours. They are Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, one to three. And if those won't work for you, then on an irregular basis, I'll be glad to, to meet you otherwise at some other time. Now, I want to ins insist that I'm happy to see you. I'd be, I'd be thrilled to see you. On the one hand, I, I, I have two reasons. One of them is that I, I, I think it is a tr it's true, I can truthfully say, I'm actually interested in each of you doing well in this class and later in your life. I really do hope, hope the best for you. But when someone says that, you should almost always assume that they're lying, okay? <laughs> because no one is really interested in the well-being of, of other people that much, right? We're all evolutionary, ev evolutionarily quite selfish creatures. So let me tell you clearly why I have a selfish reason to want you to come in. Okay, all instructors on, on campus, including me, are graded uh, on a variety of things. Like our bosses, you know, we have performance metrics and things like that. And I promise you, my, my, my boss would be tickled pink if everyone in this class made an A. So it, it's just frankly in my own selfish interest for you to do as good as you can. Now it has nothing to do with you, it has everything to do with me. <laughs> and so you, you, you can take that to be just flatly honest. I really do mean it. I would love to see you in my office hours. Okay, and you can take the first reason or the second. Good. Any questions before we get to uh, calculus? Yeah? So, the way that that procedure goes is that, uh, for example, last week the quiz ended uh, Saturday at noon. And the testing center closes at, at that time. And so I picked up the quizzes from the testing center, center yesterday morning and then distributed them to the graders yesterday afternoon. So they're in the hands of the graders. It's going to take a few days. And I would suspect probably, surely by next Monday, but probably by Friday, the grades will be, the quizzes will be scanned and the grades will be in the gradebook for your viewing pleasure. Other questions? Yes? Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 1 to 3. Other questions? place if you look at the announcements what one of the announcements is called keys or something like that and then there's a video key and also PDFs of course yeah yeah it's there if you have if you can't find it 
So, so look through the announcements on Blackboard. It's there. But if you have, have further difficulty, I'll send me an email. Other questions? Okay, so let's get to it. Calculus. So this is section 8.2. Uh, and the title is Volume. and average value. <laughs> Which is, to me, honestly, kind of weird because I can't think of any good reason to combine those two things together <laughs> into one section, right? They sort of, they don't go together. But we'll just, we'll do it that way. Okay. So this is a continuation of what we, and, and even sort of a repetition of what we said at the end of last time. So suppose that we take a rectangle. And if its base has size delta x, and its height is size f of x. Then what's the area of this rectangle? Mm -hmm. Base times height. Okay. Now what I want you to, to imagine is that we take this rectangle and we rotate it about the x-axis. So it's going to come around this way. So it's going to rotate around the axis and it's going to sweep out a particular shape. <coughs> what is the name of the shape that it will sweep out? What three-dimensional shape? Cylinder. But cylinder is kind of one of those funny words in, in English, anyway, where when they're so flat like that, sometimes they're not called cylinders. Because it's so flat, you might be conceptually more comfortable calling it a disc. But do understand that it's a cylinder. So now, in seventh grade in Miss Harris's class, or what have you, this is how you typically drew a cylinder. Like a soup can. So uh, let's suppose that this height is h, and that the radius is r. Then, what is the volume of this cylinder? So what is it? Right, it's pi r squared and then multiplied by h. Now, to make sure that you understand why that is a reasonable formula is that this, the mathematician, mathematician's name for for this is uh, not cylinder. Rather, this is called a right circular cylinder. A right circular cylinder. It's called a right circular cylinder. So right circular 
cylinder. It's called right because that is a right angle. The angle between the height extent and the radial extent are a right angle. What I want you to imagine is it is like taking this circle and moving it straight up like <coughs> this and sweeping that circle through space. And the direction of motion of the circle is perpendicular to the, air, to the plane that the circle lies in. So what I'm telling you is that you could, I could imagine like taking this cylinder and if it was flimsy, like making it lean over a little bit. Okay, that would, that would still be a circular cylinder, but it wouldn't be a right circular cylinder. Okay, furthermore, if you were to take a different shape, a different shape as the base, instead of a circle, if you made it an ellipse, then you could have a right elliptical cylinder or just an elliptical cylinder if it wasn't right. And then you could take, in the end, any shape that you want, right? You could take like a, a fish, right? You could, take a, you could take a fish shape as the base and then extrude the fish at a, at a right angle to the plane that the fish is in and it would be a right fish cylinder, okay? Now, the reason why the formula looks the way it is is that it takes the form This is the area of the base. Right, the area of the circle. And then multiplied by the height. So base times height. Okay. That being the case then, what is the formula for the volume of this cylinder in terms of these measurements? So in the first place, what is its, uh, say, what's its radius? Not quite. What's its radius? Yeah, its radius is f of x, right? It's upside down. But. So the radius is f of x. And what is its height? Delta x, right? It's the same as the height. It's the same as this measurement. This measurement that measurement. As a result, you can tell me the volume of that particular cylinder. So what is it? Very good. So that's the area of that cylinder in terms of those measurements written there. So this is step one. So step two is, well, what, it, what we really want to get at is the following scenario. Suppose we have a function on the interval a to b. And then it looks something like that. This is y is f of x. And you can see this particular um, this particular area. Now we have a formula for that area. 
That's the integral. The integral of f from a to b. There should be a b there. Now, what I want you to imagine now, what we're doing, is that we're going to take that whole area there and we're going to rotate it around the axis. Rotate it around. And this area, as it rotates around the axis, will sweep out a volume, just like this rectangle sweeps out a volume. Now, this one's easier to understand visually, right? This rectangle sweeps out a cylinder. This thing sweeps out some other kind of thing. It doesn't have a name, but to me anyway, it looks kind of like a vase or something. So my trick for getting this right, making it look reasonable, is that I draw the top side, and then for those starting in points, then I take that one and I try and eyeball it and make sure that one's right. Same distance below. And then this one also the same distance below. And then, I just kind of hope for the best. <laughs> Not too bad. Okay, and then now to make it a three dimensional object, it will look like something like that. So, what I want you to take away from this, uh, if you've ever seen a clay potter's wheel, you know, a, 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 a pottery making mm -hmm. wheel, it would be like this, except this is not a vase, okay, it's solid. You couldn't pour any water in it because it's full of clay. Okay, so does everybody understand the shape that we're talking about? The objective is we want to find the volume of this shape. Okay, we want the volume of that. And we're going to do the only thing we know how. We're going to approximate it. Let's, a, let's find an approximation for the volume of that shape. Okay, so this is step three. So we're going to take <clears throat> this function. OK, and then we're going to cut it into pieces. In particular, we're going to cut it into n pieces. But because I've got to draw something definite, I'm cutting it into exactly four pieces. Now, because these are n equal width pieces, what's the standard name we're going to use for the width? of each piece. In fact, I don't want to draw these. I want these to be like that. It'll look better if I do it that way. So what's the name for the width of each one of those? No takers? <laughs> Delta x. We're going to make them all have width delta x. And then, now let's think about this for a moment. 
What if, what if that interval, A to B, was the interval, interval uh, say, 20 to 100? What's the length of the interval, 20 to 100? Eighty. Now, supposing that I said I want you to take the interval twenty to a hundred, and I want you to cut it into ten equal pieces. Then, what is the length of each piece? Eight, right? Because it's the length of the interval <coughs> divided by ten. So now, what I'm telling you is that we're going to take this interval a to b. <coughs> What's the length of the interval A to B? I, I do agree with that. <laughs> but just only using the letters A and B, what's the length of the interval A to B? So, what is it? A to B, delta X. Not quite. So, let, let's back up. To, to have something more definite. What's the length of the interval 20 to 100? 80. And how did you do that? You subtracted them. What's the length of the interval A to B? B minus A. That's its length. What if I wanted you to cut the interval A to B into 10 equal pieces? Then what would be the length of each piece? Yeah, B minus A, the length, divided by 10. If I wanted you to cut it into uh, 30 pieces, it'd be B minus A over 30. What if I want you to cut it into N pieces? Then it's what? B minus A over N. <coughs> so that's the length of each one. Now, have a consistent naming scheme, we're going to call this one x0, <coughs> the, leftmost, the leftmost fence post is x0, the rightmost fence post is xn, which is to say they're numbered left to right as x0, x1, x2, x3, x4, and because, in this picture, because of this picture, that one's x4. But if I was to draw a really, really complicated picture, right, there could be millions of them. Okay? So, <clears throat> my next question to you is, what about if we're at, say, this one, And I know on the picture that's x3, but let's call it xi, because maybe in a different picture there'd be millions of fence posts, and I'm pointing at, say, the 1,326th fence post. How do you get to that fence post? What's the procedure to get there? Well, we're not, we're not integrating yet. It's even, even before this. We're, just, we're still setting things up. So what I want you to see, for example, the way you get to fence post x1 is you start at the leftmost fence post, x0, and you move to the right how much? Delta x. So to get to x1, you move over one step of size delta x. How do you get to x2? <coughs> you start at x0, and then you make two steps. How do you get to x1326? Right, you start at fence post x0, and you take 1326 steps to the right of size delta x. So the ith fence post is, well, you start at the leftmost fence post, and then you make how many steps to the right? Mm -hmm. 
well, well, three in this drawing, but generally i steps of size delta x. So what this formula is saying is you start at the left and then move to the right however many steps you need. So if you, if you wanted to find x27, then you'd start at the left fence post and take 27 steps to the right of size delta x. Okay? So any question about this? So now that we've cut it into n pieces, we need to do one last step. In each one of these pieces, you need to select a point. So any point in that one, any point in that one, any point in that one, any point in that one. So I'm going to select this point, and this point, and uh, say this point, and this point. So those little green points. Now, in this class, I'm not going over how you select those points because that's just not something that we study in this class. So I'm glossing over that matter. Uh, in the end, it won't matter. It won't actually end up making a difference for us. But if you go on and you want to be a quantitative analyst or some other field that uses a lot of math, then just how you select those points might become of interest to you. So the name for these points, these points that we're selecting, those are called CI. That's their names. Now, what they do is they tell you where, how high of a rectangle you're, you're going to select. So, for example, for this point right here, you just go up to the function, and wherever you hit it, right there, that's how high the rectangle is going to be. So that rectangle is right there. So for the next one, you just draw up until you hit the function. I hit it. That's the height of the next rectangle. You draw, you go up until you hit the function. That's the height of the next one. And you go up until you hit the function. That's the height of the next one. Okay. So we've got the red function that's drawn there. And now using this procedure, it's like we have this other function, this green function, that's, that just has, that, that's constant in each interval. So it's constant for this. It's constant because it's a flat line in this interval. And then it's constant in that interval, and then it's constant in that interval, and then it's constant in that interval. So now, what we're going to say is that, okay, I know that you want me to rotate that red function around the, around the axis. But that's a little complicated. So instead of rotating the red function, we're going to rotate the green function. And we're going to rotate the green function around the axis. Which won't be too bad, because in the end, the green function is just the collection of these rectangles, right? So we're just rotating finitely many rectangles around the axis. So we'll make the rotation. So the first one was maybe like that, and then the next one was a little below it, and the next one a little above, and the next one much more above. So that's kind of, that's, I'm just trying to copy that over there. And so now each of these is going to rotate around. So we'll see something that looks like this. Okay, and then each one of those uh, revolves around to make a cylinder.
So in that picture, we've got four cylinders. So can you see the four individual ones? So we could find the volume of each one. We get to find the volume of each one because they correspond to these over here, don't they? So let's find the measurements of the ith rectangle over here. The ith rectangle over here will be like this. What's its base? They all have the same base. It's delta x. OK, and then what is the height of the ith rectangle? Well, it's the value of the function. That's what it means for the green to be touching the red. But, for ex but where is it that you're evaluating the function? at ci. So this is f of ci. So what I'm telling you is each one of these rectangles, each one of these n rectangles is being rotated around individually. So that means that here we have a rec uh, this a copy of that rectangle over there on the left. Here I'm drawing the ith cylinder and it will look like this. My question to you is, what is the volume of this cylinder? Very good. It'll be pi times the radius squared. Well, the radius is f of ci, right? Is the height of this rectangle over here. So pi f of ci squared and then times the height, delta x. That's the area of just one of them, right? That's the area of just one of them. So then to get the area of all of them, that's not the area, sorry, volume. This is the volume of just one of them. So to get the volume of this whole thing, to get the volume of this whole thing, therefore the volume is uh, pi f of c1 squared delta x. That's the volume of the first one, the first cylinder, plus pi f of c2 squared delta x. So that's the volume of the first cylinder plus the volume of the second cylinder plus dot 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 all the way up to the nth cylinder. So f of c n squared delta x. Now wouldn't it be convenient if we had some shorter way to write this sum? That'd really be something, wouldn't it? <laughs> sorry, sorry, I can't help myself. Okay, so how can you write this? The Greek sigma, right? So the sum from i is 1 to n of pi f of ci 
squared delta x. So what this is, this is an approximation of the volume of the shape that, of, of the shape we talked about. And we're approximating it with n cylinders. So now, cylinders, cylin has a D in it, cylinders. There's a little D in there. So, <clears throat> you know, if this is an engineering problem, then it might suffice for you to use 100 cylinders. That might be good enough. Okay, and there'd be no reason to use any more. Uh, but if this is a <laughs> physics problem, then maybe 100 cylinders is, isn't enough, but um, 10,000 cylinders is good enough. There's no, there's no need to do any better than that for, for a physics problem. But this is a calculus problem, so we're not interested in an approximation, we're interested in the exact answer. So how can we get to the exact answer? for the volume of this shape. How do you get it to be exact? No takers? <laughs> well, suppose that we suppose that we did it with a hundred cylinders. And we said, that's good, but not good enough. How could we get it to be even better, the approximation? More cylinders, right? If 100's not enough, maybe 1,000. If 1,000's not enough, maybe a million. Right? It's getting better and better all the time. The calculus point of view is that, well, let's just use infinitely many of them then. If, if, a, if a thousand's better than a hundred, and if a million's better than a thousand, let's just use infinitely many of them. Let's just go ahead and do it. So, step four is that now you let the number of cylinders in go to infinity. Specifically, the limit, as n goes to infinity, of the sum from i is 1 to n of pi f of ci squared delta x. So that is the exact answer supposing that limit exists. But wouldn't it be nicer to write this in sort of a more compact way? Right? Wouldn't it be nicer? This is just another instance of that joke that we've said so many times now. What's the long-standing math joke about limits with Greek symbols? <laughs> they, become, they become Latin symbols, right? So then this now this fancy, big Greek sigma is going to be a, become a fancy, big Latin S. Ha ha. And then pi f of x squared dx. And this is almost right, but this is not right. What's missing here? the limits of integration. Okay, so here it is. So now all the stuff before this, I'm not going to ask you to be able to reproduce the argument for why this formula is what it is. 
but you still need to be familiar with the steps because if you're, if you're totally unfamiliar with the steps and you try and take the strategy of only memorizing the formula, I promise you, you will not be able to answer half the questions. Okay? So you've got to be, you've got to understand the, the, the underlying reason why the formula works the way it does. So this is something you must memorize. This is the volume of the solid of revolution, revolution. of y is f of x on a to b about the x-axis. That is to say, it's the volume of this shape. So, I'd like, to, I'd like to point out something. I hope that you're getting a very strong deja vu about the way we defined the integral originally. Isn't this just like it? Yeah. This is an extremely common tactic in Calculus 2. For example, when we defined the integral in the first place, the way that it goes is you say, okay, here's a shape. All that we have is the definition of the area of a rectangle. That's it. And we've got some other shape that's not a rectangle. And we want to we give an area to that shape. Well, the way that you do it is you take that shape and you cut it into rectangles. And those rectangles need to approximate each piece. And then you say, here I have an approximation. And then I can make the approximation better by using more rectangles. And then I can make it no longer an approximation, but an exact value by using infinitely many rectangles. <coughs> so the calculus point of view, literally, is to say that every shape is actually an infinite collection of infinitely many infinitesimal rectangles. Every shape actually is just, in fact, composed of, of infinitely many rectangles. That's how they're made. This argument that we just went through is saying that shapes that are obtained by revolving them around an axis, their volumes really can be understood as, so the way that we, the way that we attack the problem is we said, well, let's cut it into, into finitely many cylinders and make an approximation. Then we could make the approximation better by using more cylinders. And then we can make the result exact by using infinitely many cylinders. So what I'm telling you is that from the calculus point of view, the calculus point of view is saying is that this shape in fact is the collection of infinitely many infinitesimal cylinders. That's how it is construed. It just actually is. If you could look close enough, it would just be made of cylinders. That's what it is. And you might think, oh, I don't know. It seem, seems kind of seems crazy. Well, a little, a little later in the class, we're going to be interested in surface areas. Instead of volumes, right, uh, you know, if, if this was just a shell, how much water would you have to pour into it so it would be full? That's the question that we're addressing. A different question would be, if this was just a shell, how much paint would it take to paint it? What's the surface area of the object? Well, we're going to answer that question. 
the surface area of that object. And the way that we're going to answer it is by we're going to cut the surface, we're going to approximate it with parallelograms. And we can calculate the area of a parallelogram. So we can come up with an estimate for the area, the surface area, by cutting it into finitely many parallelograms. And we can make the estimate better by cutting it into more parallelograms. And then we can make the, the, the answer exact and not an estimate by cutting it into infinitely many infinitesimal parallelograms. So we're just, I, that's the way <laughs> the rest of integral calculus is going to go. We're just going to take whatever thing that we want and cut it into infinitely many little things. And I'd like to just, Im I'd like to impress upon you just how strong and ubiquitous that technique is. So for, in, in understanding machines. So for example, each of us, <coughs> each of us is, appears to be a coherent machine, right? So I look at you, I see y'all doing your things and, and whatever, you, you, you by all appearances are, are coherent and unitary machines. But in fact, if you were to look quite close at any of us, then you're actually the collection of billions and billions of little individual machines. And what are they called? Cells. You're actually a collection of just billions and billions of individual machines called cells. And we could look at each of us and see all the individual machines. And your collective action is, is actually the sum action of all of the cells that you consist of. But then even if you were to look at a cell closely, cells themselves cons consist of millions and millions of individual machines of various uh, descriptions. Right? The cell wall is, is made of phospholipids and other cholesterols and things like that. That's how you define the inside and the outside of the cell. And then inside of the cell is all kinds of wonderful machinery, proteins and DNA and RNA and various other things. Millions of machines, if you look close enough. And then for each one of those machines, you look close enough. They are each composed of even tinier machines, atoms. And they're all working along, doing their thing. Atoms themselves are further composed of various subatomic particles. And it's a, it's a long-standing game in physics to try and see just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Right? What, what's made of what? So what I'm telling you is that this idea of taking a shape, taking a thing, and cutting it into pieces, and looking at the way the individual pieces work, this is an extremely common technique. It's an, an extremely important technique. Okay, that being said, now let's do some calculations. So, for example, consider the volume obtained by rotating f of x is x plus 1 on 1 to 4 about the x-axis. So in the first place, I want you to draw what it is that we're talking about.
Okay. So, in the interest of time, So it looks something like this. So this is one and this is four. Why why am I interested in one and four? Because <coughs> that's what it says, right? <laughs> it's from one to four. Okay. So now if you were to plot y is f of x. How will it appear? So the plot of y is x plus 1, well, that's a line, right? So what is the y value when x, when x is 1? 2. So we'd have a point there. And then what is the y value when x is 4? Maybe five, oh. yeah? So, so that's, that's the drawing of what is to be rotated. Okay, so any question about why that's what, what's going to be rotated looks like. So now, We'll rotate it. Okay. So any question about why the shape looks the way it does? So this shape is, is actu actually is common enough in human experience to have its own name. Does anyone know the name of this shape? Lampshade. Lampshade. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Does anyone know a technical name for this, <laughs> for this shape? It has at least two technical names that I'm aware of. One of them is truncated cone. I guess that is to say reckoning this as like a cone, but someone cut the top off of it. So it's a truncated cone. But another name for this shape actually is frustum. So this is called a frustum. For those of you who like watching TV or playing video games, when you look at a TV screen at something that's going on, then you, you can see a certain volume of space, right? If, if something is too far to the side, then it's out of the view of the camera. So there's a certain, there's a certain distance to the left that you can go, a certain distance to the right, a certain distance down and up that you can go and still be in the view of the camera. And then furthermore, if there's a back wall, like the back of the stage, if you're behind the stage, you can't see anything back there either. That volume of space that you can see through a camera, that volume is called a frustum, the viewing frustum. So this would be like a camera that has, instead of a rectangular cross section, has a circular cross section. So this would be a, a different kind of frustum. Any question about this shape? Okay, then the next request is I want you to find its volume. 
volume. Okay, so I, I think it's clear that we need to use that formula from the previous page, which is to say an integral from a to b of pi f of x squared dx. The formula just sort of is what it is. My question to you is, is how do things get plugged into the various locations? So in the first place, what are the limits of integration? One to four. And then pi is a constant, so it's just pi. And then what's f of x? x plus one. So x plus one, all squared, and then dx. So is there any question why it comes to this? Okay, so then how can we proceed? Okay, so I, I take that to mean to use the fundamental theorem, right? So that we could, com we could compute an antiderivative and use that to evaluate the integral. Okay, so there's lots of ways to compute this antiderivative. How should we go? Yeah, pi is a constant, so you could think of it as being factored out. Okay, you could multiply it out, right? You could say that x plus 1 all squared is actually x squared plus 2x plus 1 after FOIL. That would work. You could do that. So you could do FOIL. That would work. Uh, another thing you could do is you could do a substitution. What would be the substitution we'd do? Yeah, we do u is x plus 1. And everything that goes with that, the differential part and everything. However, on integrals that are, that are this simple, and this is a simple integral, I would hope that eventually you'd be able to do the corresponding antiderivative entirely in your head, like in the following way. So the antiderivative of, say, uh, 3 multiplied by t plus 6 to the 8 dt. So this is an aside. It's not related to this one, but I'm showing you a technique. So if we were to do a substitution on this one, if we were to say u is t plus 6, Then what's du? No. I know what you mean, but one is not correct. One dt, right? So du is dt. So whenever you do a substitution, and the differential part of the substitution looks like this, that du is dt, or du is dx, so that there's no difference. Such, such antiderivatives are, are trivial. You don't even really need to do anything. So this 3 is just a 3, and then the answer will be t plus 6 to 9 divided by 9, plus a constant. So it's my hope that if not now, then, then very soon, after enough practice, you'll be able to do this antiderivative without even needing to write down the substitution. Okay, so if you're not convinced of this, practice a bunch of these and see that it works. That being the case, that being the case, do you see that this one is just like that one? So what would the answer be then? Very good. 
very good. Okay, it, but because we're using the fundamental theorem and this is an integral, it will be evaluated from one to four. Okay, now another matter that I hope you would have observed by now. If not by now, then, then very soon. So when you're evaluating something like this, so like seven, x squared plus x from 2 to 5. When you have a constant out front like this, so you can see it's a constant multiplied by some expression in x evaluated from 2 to 5. Then a, a very nice trick for evaluating this kind of thing is to keep the 7 factored out, which is to say 7 multiplied by whatever minus whatever. So you keep the 7 factored out and then you evaluate, the, you evaluate just that part at 5 and just that part at 2. This can make the arithmetic far easier to deal with. So what is x squared plus x evaluated at 5? Thirty. And then what is x squared plus x evaluated at 2? Well, it'd be 4 plus 2 is 6. And then multiply out the 7. So that being the case, what I'm telling you is that the easiest thing to do for this example is to consider this as being pi over 3 multiplied by x plus 1 cubed evaluated from 1 to 4 and observe that pi over 3 is a constant. And because pi over 3 is a constant, this will look like pi over 3 and then it will be something minus something. So what goes here? Well, we'll plug in 4. 4 plus 1 is 5. And then to exponent 3, 125. Because 5 times 5 is 25 times another 5 <coughs> is 125. Okay, then what goes in here? Eight, right? Because one plus one is two to exponent three is eight. So this would be one, one, seven, pi over three. And then is 117 divisible by three? How do you tell? Right. You look at the digits in 117. The digits are 1 and 1 and 7. What is 1 plus 1 plus 7? 9. Is 9 divisible by 3? Yes. yes, and therefore so is 117. How about 111? Is 111 divisible by 3? Yes, because 1 plus 1 is 3, which is divisible by 3. How about... 250. Is 250 divisible by 3? No, because 2 plus 5 plus 0 is 7, and 7 is not divisible by 3. Okay, so then we could simplify this a little bit. To get to 117, I'd need 33 threes and then 6 more, so that'd be 39. So 39 pi. Any question about this example? So what we're saying about this is that if this were a bucket, then it would take 39 pi liters to fill it. That's what, that's what we're saying.
Any question about this example? Okay. Let's look at it another way. <coughs> Consider the volume obtained by rotating f of x is x plus 1 on 1 to 4 about the y-axis. And I want you to draw it. Now, wait a second. Is this exactly the same question that we just did? And it, if it is not exactly the same, then how is it different? Correct. So now we're taking something and we're rotating it around the y-axis, which is to say we're going to rotate it around the vertical axis instead of the horizontal axis. Okay. Well, I'll draw the first bit since it's just a copy of what's on the previous page. So this is one and this is four. Uh, no, that's one mark four. So that's what's going to be rotated. But now it's going to be rotated like this. So does everyone see the distinction between this exercise and the previous one? It's going to be rotated like this. OK. So when you look at the picture, looks like Okay, so is there any question about the shape? Any question about it? So it's being rotated around the y axis. Okay. And now two, we want to compute its volume. So now here is where any student who tries to just memorize formulas will be probably quite lost. Okay, So let's think about this carefully. We're considering these volumes of solids of revolution. And in the end, what was the, what was the underlying idea? Is that we're going to cut the volume into what? In, into what, what specific little things? 
So did we cut them into little fishes or, or what? Cylinders, right? We cut, we cut the shape into little cylinders. That was the idea. Now, <coughs> when we were doing it originally, when we were defining, when we were defining it, it looked like this. So we were cutting and making these cylinders sort of going that way. Okay? Going, if you like, left and right. Will this one be the same? No, right? When we were defining it, the cylinders were like this, but in the present exercise, do you see that they really need to be like that? Okay. So now, in the definition, when we were going through the definition, we cut, we cut the shape into these finitely many cylinders. What was, what was the height, that is to say, this step size? What was the name for the step size? That one has the same width as that one has this delta x, right? So we're going this way. Because of the orientation of the cylinders, that means that these are delta x's. But what are we going to be doing here for this one? Delta y's. Because we're not going left and right, we're going up and down. So the first observation in order to succeed on this exercise is we're going to be using delta y's. not delta x's. So does everyone see the first distinction? So that means that one of the first things we need to do, uh, among the things we need to do, is we need to find the limits, limits of integration. So what are going to be the limits of integration? Are the limits of integration 1 to 4? Probably not, because why would I ask? <laughs> what are the limits of integration? That is to say, sorry? It is 2 to 5. Now, how did you come to that? Because we're going vertically, right? The question is, is what is the lowest extent of the shape? What is the furthest down we need to go to be in the shape? Can you see that it's whatever this value is? OK, well, that's 2. <coughs> So we're going to be integrating going up, like going up, right? The integration only starts at 2. And then how far up do we need to go? Up to 5, as you say. So is it clear why the, that the limits of integration are vertical? Furthermore, that means that the formula the formula has to look like this. It will be the integral from 2 to 5 of pi and then something squared dy. And the thing is, is that what goes in here? What goes in here is the y radius. Whatever this is, whatever y radius happens to be. So let me write that in red so that you understand that that's a, that's, I'm inserting some English in there. That's not a formula.
So the question that we need to address now is what is this? So how do we figure out that? So there's no R's in this exercise. So it's definitely not anything with R. So remember, in the original formula, when we were integrating left and right, that, means, that meant that this was a formula f of x. Right, f of x is what went in here when we were integrating left and right. Now, because we're integrating up and down, this is not going to be a function of x. What is this going to be? It's going to be a function of y. Well, how do we figure it out? What function of y gets put in there? Well, let's think about it for a moment. What is the formula for this line right here? Well, let's, I want to do the simple one first. Do we, can we all agree that this is y is x plus 1? Because after all, it's, it's y is f of x. But this is expressing y as a function of x. We'd rather have it the other way around, which is to say we want x to be a function of y. So in this, expression, in this equation, can you solve for x? Yeah, what would you get if you solved for x? Other way around. x is? Very good. It's that that gets put in there. So as a result, what is the integral that we must evaluate? So its limits are what? 2 to 5. And then pi, because that's always there. And then what is it? What is this thing being squared? y minus 1 and then dy. OK, interesting. Kind of, kind of mind-bending to turn <laughs> the problem on its side, right? You've got to think about all the consequences of turning all of those cylinders from being the one way to the other way. OK, well, then this now, once you get to here, it's pretty straightforward from here, because this antiderivative is just like the one on the previous page. So that pi is just going to hang out because it's a constant. And then what is the antiderivative of y minus 1 all squared? Very good. And then we'll evaluate this from 2 to 5. And I'll do it with the same trick as before. I'll pack factor out the pi over 3. And then I'm going to evaluate y minus 1 cubed at 5. Well, what is y minus 1 cubed evaluated at 5? So putting in, putting in 5. 5 minus 1 is 4. Cubed is 64. <laughs> 4 times 4 times 4. 
and then minus, putting two in there. Well, two minus one is one, cubed is one. So 63 pi over three, so 21 pi. Interesting. So these two exercises, uh, they're talking about two pretty similar shapes, similar looking shapes. Uh, so this is the one that we did first, and then we did this one. So supposing, supposing that we made two different buckets, right? One, in, one like this, and then one like that. I could ask, well, which bucket is the bigger bucket? And why? Which of these two is the bigger bucket? Yeah, this one's the bigger bucket. In the end, because its volume is 39 pi. And the volume of this one is 21 pi. This one would hold more paint or nachos or whatever it is that you, <laughs> you really want to put in there. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Any question about this? Okay. One more of these before we move to something else. Yeah. And that is, again, from seventh grade in Miss Harris's class or whatever. You probably came face to face with this shape. <clears throat> okay, and what's the name for that shape? Cone, right? That's probably what your teacher called it. But since this is a, ma a university math class, I will give it its proper name. This is called a right circular cone. Right because the angle between the height and the radius is a right angle. Circular because each cross section is a circle. So you could imagine if this, if this cone were mobile, I could sort of bend it over and it would still be a cone looking thing, but it wouldn't be a right circular cone anymore. Similarly, we could make the base something else. For example, what is a right square cone? That's a perfectly legitimate mathematician's name, but most people don't call it a right square cone. What do most people call a right square cone? Uh, sorry? Uh, prism is one name, but there's an even more common name. I'm thinking of Egypt. A pyramid, right? <laughs> a right square cone is a pyramid. Okay. But you can make the base any old shape that you want. And if it was a banana, it'd be a right banana cone or whatever. Okay, so then supposing that, supposing that uh, this has height h and radius r. Then, in, uh, in seventh grade or so, they should have informed you of the volume of such a cone. So what's the formula for the volume? That's close. It, there is a one-third, 
and there is a pi r squared, and then h. So that's the formula for the volume. <coughs> now, I'd like for you to observe that if you ignore the one third for a moment, what is that? Same thing as what? Pi r squared h. What is that? Yeah, that's the formula for the volume of a cylinder. Which is to say, if, if you took this circle on the base and put it right at the top on that point, <laughs> so loud, then you'd have, a, you'd have a cylinder, and this cone would be sitting inside of a cylinder. Wow. It's interesting that the cone has exactly one-third of the volume of the cylinder. It's exactly one-third of the volume. So if we had a cylinder sitting right here, and it had volume 30, and then we put a cone inside of it that just, that just fit inside, then what's the volume of that cone? 10. Interesting. So this is something that was just pro probably stated to you as a fact. You know, from on high, Miss Harris commands that the volume of such a cone is one third pi r squared h. Okay, well, I, I promise you that it's not, uh, you know, in the end, it's not Miss Harris's authority that makes it be that. Okay, let, let's show, let's do it here and now. Let's show that the formula for the volume of a cone is this. Okay. So in particular, if this is H, and this is R, then we could draw this line. And what I want you to imagine is rotating this line around the x-axis. So what would you get if you did that? It's like a, it's like a symphony. <laughs> So do you observe that we'd get exactly the shape in question just turned on its side? So if we could find the volume of this using, our, using the methods that we know, then we could establish the formula. OK. Well, we know that the formula, we know that the formula should be an integral. What are the limits of integration? How far left? How far right? <coughs> well, we don't need numbers. I'm not, I, by that I, I take it, I take it, you mean numerals, like three. We don't need them. <laughs> we don't, we won't need, 
roads where we're going, right? <laughs> uh, not quite. So what's the furthest left that we go? So we don't need to integrate over here because that's not in the shape. That is to say, not over here. So we start integrating when we get here. What is this horizontal value? It's zero. So we're going to integrate from zero to where? To h. So zero to h. <coughs> okay. Then the, what we're going to integrate is pi and then something squared dx. And the thing that goes in there, the thing that goes in there is whatever this is. Whatever that line is. Right? We need to know the equation of that line as a function of x. So what is that as a function of x? Well, how can we figure that out? Well, this red, it's a line, isn't it? It's a line. Because that's the, the, the side of a cone, which is straight. So that means that it's got to look like y is mx plus b. for some m and some b, right? Now we just need to figure out, now we're just haggling for price, right? What's m and what's b? Well, what does b represent for a line? What does it represent? The y-intercept. Well, for the line that we need, what is the y-intercept? It's zero, right? Because it's going through the origin. So the line that we need has b is equal to zero. OK. And for a line, what does m represent? Slope. And what is the slope of the line that we're looking at? Well, remember, back in college algebra, slope is reckoned as the ratio of two things that start with R, colloquially. It's blank over blank. What are they? Rise over run, right? What is the rise of this line? R. That's how much it goes up. And what's the run of this line? Zero to H. So just h. So the slope, that's rise over run. Which on that line up there, what is it? R over h. As a result, what's the equation of that line? It'll be y is what? I'm just going to press on as. I'm just going to pretend it's not happening. y is r over h x. 
and then plus zero, right? So what's the integral that we have to evaluate? So it's zero to h, pi, and then what? Sorry? Right. R over h, x squared dx. OK, this is what we have to integrate. So now I'm going to, um, I'm going to go ahead and distribute the square and get that this is the integral from 0 to h of pi r squared divide by h squared and then x squared dx. So I collected all of these together because pi r and h are all constants. They're all constants, which means that that's like a constant multiple of x squared. So what I'm telling you is that you could, I could hide this and say that, well, suppose there was a 7 in there. Suppose I'm ob obscuring a 7. Then what is the antiderivative of 7 x squared? Suppose I'm hiding a, a 7, then what's the, what would be the antiderivative? 7x cubed over 3. And if I was hiding a 10, it'd be 10x cubed over 3. If I was hiding any constant, it'd be that constant times x cubed over 3. Well, what I'm telling you is that that's a constant. It looks funny, but it's constant with respect to x. So. That is pi r squared over h squared multiplied by x cubed over 3 and then evaluated from x is 0 to x is h. And so now, now I'm going to take this division by 3. Dividing by 3 is the same as multiplying by what? A third, right? So I'm going to move it to the front as multiplication by 1 third and say that this is 1 third uh, pi r squared over h squared x cubed and then evaluated from 0 to h. So all that stuff in front all that stuff in front is a constant. So that's one third pi. Uh, oops. One third pi r squared over h squared and then multiplied by h cubed minus 0 cubed. And now, the 0 cubed, that's 0, so it just goes away. And supposing we take that expression right there and we perform some cancellation. Will some cancellation occur? What, what symbols will cancel? So will anything cancel the r squared, say? Nah. Will anything cancel the pi? Nah. What's going to end up canceling? Some of the h's, right? How much h will be left? Just one of them, right? 
in the numerator. And after you cancel it, what do you get? You get that, <laughs> which was the whole point, right? <coughs> Right? That's what you say these days, right? <laughs> That's what you're supposed to say? I don't know. I'm not really, not really aware. Interesting. So we, we established that the formula for the volume of a right circular cone is exactly one-third of the volume of the, of the circumscribing cylinder. So I'll, I'll dream up something like this for you to do on the homework, where you'll come up with the volume of, you know, something else. I'm not sure. I'll have to think about it. Any question about it? So it's kind of interesting. What we're doing is we're imagining this cone is actually constructed of infinitely many infinitesimal cylinders, like little disks all sitting on top of each other. OK, any question about any of that before we move to an unrelated topic? OK, so now we're going to talk about average. So in the first place, we have the discrete case. That is to say, what if right now I was to give you 10 values? And I said, I want you to take those 10 values and I want you to compute their average, then what would you do? Add them all up and divide by 10. And if I was to give you 1,326 values, then what would you do? Very good. So generally, if you're given n values, and the values you're given are a1, a2, a3, all the way up to an. So I give you n different values. Then the average is exactly as y'all say. It is the sum a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus dot, 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 plus an. You add them all up. And then you divide by n. But there's a more convenient way to write the numerator. What way? I'm, I'm not sure. I, I couldn't hear you because of the hammer. <laughs> not quite. There's something else. Some, some simpler way to, to represent the sum of all these things. The sigma thing. So this would be the sum from i is 1 to n of ai, and then all divided by n. However, for various reasons, uh, usually, when you write this in a textbook anyway, you usually don't write blah blah all over n. Rather, I'll ask it like this. Uh, dividing by 5 is the same as multiplying by what? One fifth, right? So dividing by n is the same as multiplying by what? 1 over n. So this, what we're writing, this is the formula for the average of n, of n values. Uh, sorry, that should, not, that should be a i. OK. So in principle, I could give you any number of 
of, of values and say, okay, I want you to compute their average. And you can do it with a spreadsheet or what, what have you. So now, <laughs> Suppose that m is equal to that value, 1 over n, the sum from i is 1 to n of ai. So I'm calling the average value m. Why, why does a mathematician always feel compelled to call the average value m? In the end, it's because mathematicians don't usually say average and, unless they're teaching this course. <laughs> and rather, we've got a different name for average. What's the name for average? Mean, right? You've probably heard it, at least in passing. So suppose that M is the average. What I want you to see is that if you took these values, a1, a2, a3, all the way up to an, and you replaced every one of them with m, so that you had this new set of values, m, 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 dot, 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 m, and that you had n of them. So what I'm saying is that this set of measurements, there's, there's n measurements here, there's n measurements here. But these are all m. What's the average value of these? m, right? <laughs> Which is to say, what if I gave you uh, 1,326 sevens? If I gave you that many sevens? And I said, what's the average? And you'd say, it's seven. Okay. Now, suppose that I give you, say, uh -huh. you wish it was like that? <laughs> yeah. Suppose I give you 100 values, and they're, they're, they're varying. And it turns out that their average value is five. I give you 100 different values, but their average is five then what if we were to take every single one of those values and replace every one of them with five? What would the new average be? Still five. That's what the average means. So these, these, still have average m. So what average is, when you take a population of size n, you measure whatever it is that you're measuring, n times, one for each member, and then you average it. What the average means is that if you were to replace every member with the average value, the average would not be changed. That's what it means. So now we want to do it with functions. We want to do it with functions. But the problem of it is, is that how many different values do functions have? Infinitely many, right? So the problem is now that instead of dealing with finitely many measurements, now we have infinitely many measurements. And the question is, is how are we going to extend the notion of discrete average to continuous average. Okay. Well, I bet you can imagine how we're going to do it. <laughs> it's the same way we always do it. Suppose that this is A. And this is B. And this is the plot 
of f of x. So is this, is this function a constant function? So is it, is it a constant function? Alternatively, what would it, what would it, what does, what does a constant function look like when you draw it? Like, for example, the function f of x is equal to 9. What does that function look like when you draw it? f of x is equal to 9. Mm -hmm. What kind of line? It's just straight, across. straight across, right? A horizontal line. So constant functions look like horizontal lines. Is this a constant function? No, because it's not a horizontal line. So what I'm going to give you is I'm going to draw three copies of that function. So these are all supposed to be exactly the same, but I'm only so accurate. So now, a constant function would look like a horizontal line. Now, what is the area of this shape, the area between the horizontal axis and the red? What's the formula for, for this area? That, that's volume, right? We're not talking about volume anymore. We were talking about volume. I want to talk about the area contained in here. What's the formula for the area? Sorry? <laughs> in, in Latin. So if the function is f, then f of x dx. That's the area. So what I'm saying is I copy. Th this has the same, same, same area. OK? Now, a constant function is a horizontal line. So here's a particular constant function. It's a constant function because it's a horizontal line. Now, I want you to compare the area under the red curve versus the area under the green curve. Which one is the bigger one? Which one is the bigger area? Right. So then, so the green, the area under the green curve is less than the area under the red curve. I think that's clear simply because this rectangle is contained inside that, that shape. Okay. So that means that that value, that constant value, this value is less than the average value of 
y is f of x. on A to B. Okay, now, in the rightmost one, <coughs> I want to make a constant value that's too big too big. So for example like this. So what I mean to say is that we've got this area right here because all of these red ones are all supposed to be the same. We've got that area, the area under the red curve. How does it compare to the area under the green curve? Now the area under the green curve is more than the area under the red curve. So this value is greater than the average value y is f of x on a to b. So what I want you to see from these is there's like a Goldilocks thing going on here. Okay. My porridge is too cold, right? This constant function doesn't accumulate enough area. It's less than it's less than the it's less than this area. <coughs> Porridge is too cold. And then over here, my, oh, this porridge is too hot, right? This is too much area. This is more area than that area. What I want you to see is that somewhere in between these two, between this one, which is not enough, and between this one, which is too much, there is a horizontal line which gives you exactly the area of this red. It's exactly the right area. So what you've got to do is you've got to draw a horizontal line which is sometimes over and sometimes under so that the amount of over and under cancels out. And I'm just eyeballing it. Maybe something like that. So you can see some of the time I'm too low, uh, some, some of the time the, the green is too high, some of the time the green is too low. But if I, if I did it just right, and let's assume that I did, then the area under the green is the same as the area under the red. So this is the average value. of y is f of x on a to b because this area is the same as this area. Okay, so does everybody understand what it, what it means to have found the average area? So now the question is, is okay, how do we actually find it? Let's calculate it. Okay?
So, here's the function. We want to compute its average value. So we're going to do it like this. We're going to say, OK, this function has infinitely many values. That's too many. I can't deal with infinitely many. So I'm going to somehow approximate this function into pieces and just into finitely many pieces and just use these finitely many values. What's going to be the width of each of these? The same width we always use, right? Delta x. And we're going to call this one x0, and we're going to call this one xn. What's the formula for delta x? for like the third time today. <laughs> it's B minus A over N. And then the formula to get to the ith fence post is Xi is X0 plus I delta X. And then in each interval we select a point and and I'll remind you that I'm purposefully not stating how we select a point because it's not relevant for our class what's the name of those points that we select CI, CI. what they do is they tell you how tall each rectangle is going to be so Okay, that one's that tall. Okay, that one is that tall. That one is that tall. And that one is that tall. So that means that we now have, in the picture, four, but understand conceptually we have n. <coughs> We have n values. They are f of c1, f of c2, f of cn. That is to say, the heights of those rectangles. How can we compute the average of those n values? Add them all up and divide by n. But now, let's take this formula for delta x. Delta x is b minus a over n. What if we divide both sides of this equation by b minus a? What would the new right-hand side be if we divide both sides of it with b minus a? <coughs> the left-hand side would be delta x over b minus a. And what would the right-hand side be? Not in. Almost. It'd be 1 over n. So what I'm saying is that this 1 over n right here can be replaced with delta x over b minus a. We're almost done.
And now, this is a sum, and, it's a mul and this is a constant multiple. Constant multiples can be factored into sums, just like they can be factored out of sums. So this This is our approximation of the average value of a function using n samples. So this is our approximation. How do we get the exact answer? So we approximated it with n rectangles. How is it that we get the exact answer? The same, the same way we always do, right? Infinitely many rectangles. So the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over b minus a of the sum from i is 1 to n of f of ci delta x. And then we have our little chuckle inside and say, oh, this is 1 over b minus a integral a to b f of x dx. So this is the formula for the average value of a function on an interval. So I need to write one more thing so that this is clear. Otherwise, you might lose sight of what that formula means. Is that if this is interval a to b, and this is the function, and you want to compute its average value, then just eyeballing it again, this looks to me to be approximately the average value. The formula for the height of that green line one over b minus a, the integral from a to b of f of x dx. So that formula is the formula that gives you the height of the Goldilocks green rectangle. Okay, very good. So have a nice uh, Tuesday.